Thank you everyone for being to our bike webinar. Uh, I am glad to have you here. This is a virtual introduction to the e-bike revolution as I've been terming it. Um, and this is gonna teach you how to be an e-bike expert, hopefully by the end of it. My name is Mason Shambly. I'm with Commute Smart Raleigh. Uh, we are a program within the city of Raleigh and we focus on all the ways to get around without having to need a car. So getting fewer people to drive fewer miles. And so we are happy to have all of you here um, I will go ahead and share my screen and I'll kind of talk about what our program is before we kick it off to our first presenter of the day. Awesome. So like I said, this is the e-bike revolution. And what my program focuses on is transportation demand management or TDM. And that is getting fewer people to travel fewer miles and helping folks get around town other ways, whether that's um, transit, walking, or of course, cycling. Uh, and why is this important? There's a couple of reasons. Um, our main goal is creating a more sustainable and equitable Raleigh. And so the top reasons for you getting people out of their cars into other modes or making other modes accessible uh, is for cost saving, sustainability purposes in terms of our environment, and better health, both personal health when someone chooses a sustainable means of transportation. It's usually a more active means of transportation. That's better for personal and physical health, as well as our environmental health that we all share. Um, so reducing emissions and other uh, negative carbon impacts on our natural environment. Um, and why do we do these outreach efforts? There's a couple reasons, um, and that has to do with fears of emergency. People don't understand. Um, you know, there are good alternatives to getting around by car, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to leave you stranded, and there's ways to work around that. Um, helping people overcome the fear of lack of convenience. A car does have a certain level of convenience to it because it, it operates personally in your schedule, um, but with a flexible bus schedule and with having access and knowledge of uh, proper biking, especially e-biking, which breaks down the barriers of access um, that may exist with traditional biking for some folks that um, decreases those levels of fears as well as perception, um, perception that you know transit isn't for everyone or that biking is something that isn't for everyone. And hopefully after the end of the day, that e-biking you learn is something for you uh, and that we can really get everyone on e-biking uh, and kind of my opinion and belief is that I think e-biking can save the world. And so hopefully I'm here to convince you and my panelists can convince you of that as well. Uh, and I like to just show this image here because this is really what we're working towards. Um, and this really speaks to our transit, but this is the end goal. We're getting all of these cars off the road um, and getting people into other means of transportation. This one specifically with the bus. Uh, and so in theory, all of those people have their own car they're driving and that takes up that much room on the road. But if we get all those people into a bus or to biking or walking, we get all those cars off the road and all those negative impacts that are associated with cars off the road. Um, and so again, thank you all for being here. Before I kick it off to the first presenter, I just have some housekeeping items I wanna go over. Um, first is we're going to have a QA and a session uh, at the end of this presentation. So as you're going through, if you have any questions, please add them into the Q&A function or the chat. We're going to be monitoring that if you have any kind of technical issues as well. Uh, and then finally, I will be sharing my contact information towards the end of this, as well as putting it in the chat. So if you have any questions after the webinar, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I'll be able to help you assist with any concerns you have. Um, but without further ado, with all the people here on the webinar, I want to kick it off to the people you're actually here to see, not necessarily me. Uh, and so our first presenter today is Dr. Ashley Lovell. Ash is the Electric Bicycle Policy Campaign Director for People for Bikes. She holds a PhD in environmental sociology and specializes in collaborative decision-making. Ash has worked with the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and multiple environmental organizations to tackle issues of climate change, shared land management, and sustainability. At People for Bikes, Ash leads initiatives that include e-bike safety task forces, the e-bike battery recycling program, federal, state, and local lobbying for bike legislation, and engagements with regulatory agencies. When she's not building coalitions for people for bikes, you can find her riding around the front range of Colorado on her electric cargo bike with her two little boys in tow. So without further ado, Ash, please go ahead. Thank you, Mason. I'm so excited to be here. What a great uh, conversation this is gonna be. As Mason said, I'm Dr. Ashley Lovell. You can call me Ash. I am the Electric Bicycle Policy and Campaign Director for People for Bikes. 
Um, I'm going to kick us off with a quick agenda, and then we'll dive into all the wonderful things about electric bicycles. I have the best job in the world, and I'm excited to share some of my knowledge with you and hopefully get you as excited about electric bicycles as I am. So we'll start with who is People for Bikes. There's a lot to share there. Uh, and then we'll explore what an electric bicycle is and also what it is not. This is a really important piece of the conversation. What type should you buy? As the representative of the trade association, I can't tell you exactly what type or what brand to buy, but I can share a lot about all the different types of electric bicycles there are out there. Why are electric bicycles such a big deal? I have a lot to say on this topic and I'm excited to share it with you. What should we know before we ride? This is really important. There's a lot of folks that are coming to bicycling because of electric bicycles and there's some rules of the road and safety things for us to chat about. Uh, how do we make them more affordable? You might have seen that uh, electric bicycle is a bit more uh, expensive than a traditional bicycle for a good reason, but we're working on making them even more financially accessible. What do you do with batteries when they reach the end of life? This is a big initiative of People for Bikes, and there's an adorable monster at the end of this presentation, so I hope you stick around all the way through it and you can learn about who that is. And then finally, where can you learn more? So to kick us off, who is People for Bikes? Next slide, please. People for Bikes is the Bicycle Industries Trade Association. So we represent over 320 different bicycling manufacturing uh, organizations and brands. And we believe that bikes make life great. Uh, we are the largest bicycling advocacy organization in the US. And we work uh, across federal, state, and local uh, municipalities and governments to advocate for better bicycling uh, across the country. Our goal, next slide, is to be the best place to ride a bike in the world, to make America the best place in the world. Uh, we know that we have a long way to go on this initiative, and we have three different ways that we understand that we can start to accomplish this goal. This is our long-term big vision. It's not gonna happen tomorrow. We know that it's gonna take a lot for us to get anywhere near the Netherlands, uh, but we're working on it. So the first piece of this is, next slide, uh, infrastructure, policy, and participation. These are the three really important components to helping make bicycling better in the US. Um, so infrastructure is all about uh, where can you ride safely? How do we create safe and pr protected places for people to ride? Next slide, please. And uh, how do we accelerate the construction of safe, fun, and connected places for people to ride? We realize that we can't keep people riding. We can't get more people riding if they don't have safe places to ride. As a parent myself, there are plenty of places here in Colorado where I feel very comfortable letting my two little boys go out and ride their bikes, but there's a lot of other places that I don't feel comfortable yet. So one of our big goals is to make safe, connected, and protected uh, places for people to ride, both in urban areas, suburban areas, and rural areas as well. The next piece of this is policy. So one of my big jobs as the electric bicycle policy and campaign director is to advance pro e-bike and pro e-bike business legislation. So these are things like the e-bike act that was just reintroduced in Congress. This is a federal level e-bike incentive making electric bicycles more financially affordable for more Americans. Uh, there's also different legislation at um, the municipal level. There's actually incentives at the state, local, and federal level right now that, uh, that different governments are considering for e-bikes, similar to what they're considering for electric vehicles, but we like bikes more, so that's a bigger deal for us. Um, other types of pro-bike business legislation are things like tariff relief and other, you know, nerdy topics that we don't have to get into here, but how do you take all of these great ideas that are had at the local, state, and federal level and implement them? That's the last piece, which is participation. So how do you reduce barriers to access and welcome more people to the joys of bicycling? Uh, one thing that we saw during the pandemic was a huge increase in outdoor recreation overall, but bicycling in particular, it was a great way to get out and enjoy the great outdoors, and 
uh, we saw a lot of families go out together. It was a great way to enjoy each other's company while being outside and um, burning off some energy, as many of us were stuck in our homes. What we've seen post-pandemic is that people are still riding. And a lot of these are new riders, and a lot of them are people who are riding electric bicycles. So as the trade association, one of our jobs is to do a better job of understanding who's out there, what they're riding, why they're riding it. So we're actually doing a um, e-bike owner's survey right now. We've got tens of thousands of participants that have taken the survey already. And this is going to help us better understand who are those people that are riding e-bikes, where are they riding them, why are they riding them, um, so that we can continue to encourage this e-bike revolution that uh, Mason discussed. So that's People for Bikes in a nutshell. Bicycle Industries Trade Association, absolutely one of my favorite places to work I've ever worked, full of people that are just crazy about bicycling. Okay, now we're going to move on to what is an electric bicycle. E-bikes are very similar to traditional bikes. There's uh, really three things that make a electric bicycle different than a traditional bike. That is the computer, the battery, and the motor. So electric bicycles have been around for over a decade. Many of them were originally created by piecing together different components and putting them on a traditional bike. Now we have manufacturers that are creating full electrical systems, full bikes that are specifically designed um, for this electrical boost. Uh, one of People for Bikes' big initiatives was to create the Model 3 class legislation that uh, outlines what an electric bicycle is and what it isn't. Uh, there are three classes of electric bicycles. The first is Class 1. Those are pedal assist, meaning you have to be pedaling in order for the, metal, the motor to engage, and you can only go up to 20 miles an hour. This is a very, very common class of electric bicycles. Pretty much every electric mountain bike is a class one electric mountain bike. And these bikes operate very similarly to a traditional bike. Class two bikes use a throttle, usually on the handlebars. And those bikes also can only go up to 20 miles an hour. Uh, throttles are great for if you have big hills, if you're carrying cargo, uh, if you uh, need to get through an intersection more quickly. These are also very common. There's a lot of direct to consumer brands that have class two bikes. And then class three is back to pedal assist. So you have to be pedaling for the motor to engage and the motor will cut off at 28 miles an hour. These are designed for kind of long distance commuting, uh, areas that are, you know, more road specific. That's what a uh, class three electric bicycle is generally designed for. And the wattage for electric bicycles only goes up to 750 watts. This is what the Consumer Product Safety Commission has de defined an electric bicycle as. You may have seen some products out there that go faster than 20 miles an hour with a throttle. Those are not electric bicycles. Those are out of class electric vehicles. Um, be really careful when you're looking at uh, different models of electric bicycles to make sure that they fit within this class system because the class system was designed to make sure that electric bicycles can use the same infrastructure as traditional bicycles. Different municipalities have different uh, definitions of where electric bicycles can ride. One of my big jobs is to open access for electric bicycles where appropriate. Um, but I am only advocating for electric bicycles, not these out of class electric vehicles, because we want to make sure that people are riding at responsible speeds and um, really operating safely when they're out sharing multi-use trails or bikeways. Okay, next slide, please. So one of our big initiatives at People for Bikes is this Model 3 class legislation because before we created it, all electric bicycles were defined as motorized vehicles. And now we have this beautiful map of most of the states in the US uh, using the Model 3 class legislation. If the states are green, they have Model 3 class legislation. If they are yellow, they still determine an electric bicycle to operate as a bicycle instead of as a motorized vehicle. And there are two states on that map that still consider electric bicycles as motorized vehicles, but Alaska is about to turn to green. Uh, there is a bill on the governor's desk that will say, that will institute the Model 3 class legislation in Alaska. So the last 
tiny thorn in my side is Rhode Island, and we're continuing to work on that one. But so the general gist of this map is that electric bicycles are considered bicycles in 48 states across the country, uh, including yours. So let's talk a little bit about North Carolina. Next slide. Oh, actually, first we'll talk about what type of bike you should buy, which is a very fun conversation. So e-bikes break down into the same categories as conventional bikes. So if there is a type of conventional traditional bicycle, there is a accompanying type of electric bicycle, mountain bikes, road bikes, urban bikes, hybrid bikes. One of the bike types that I am most excited about is cargo bikes. I have a cargo bike of my own that I put my little wiggly uh, sons into and take them to school. I did it this morning. This is a really exciting kind of development in bicycling, in my opinion, is getting people out of cars and onto bikes as a family. There is nothing cuter than little children riding on the back of their parents' bikes um, and waving to folks, which is what my little ones do. Uh, we are also seeing folding bikes as something that folks are getting really interested in. There's a bunch of different models out there that are uh, interesting. My dog says hi. Uh, interesting different um, ways for people to do multimodal transportation. So take the bike onto the bus and then uh, do the final few miles on the bike and vice versa. Uh, if you want to learn more about all the different types of electric bicycles, where they can be ridden, um, what the different safety components are, you can go to the link that's in the um, slide, peopleforbikes.org slash electric bicycles. And there we have a lot of very nerdy policy information on there, but also a lot of really helpful information on what types of bike uh, you should be looking at and where you can find more information. My biggest suggestion here is to talk to your local e-bike retailer. There are e-bike retailers in pretty much every town across the country now. I'm sure there are at least a handful in Raleigh, although I don't know them off the top of my head. But this is a great way to not just learn about the different types of e-bikes, but also to get to ride them. Uh, during the pandemic, there was a big uh, disconnect between interest in buying e-bikes and supply. That supply has increased dramatically over the last couple of years, and now there's plenty of bikes for you to go out and try. And I highly suggest developing a relationship with your retailer and figuring out exactly what type of bike um, feels best for you. Okay, next slide. Okay, what to look for. Make sure that your electric bicycle falls within the three-class system so that you know where you can ride it. Um, there should be a description of which class your electric bicycle is either on the bike itself. If you're at the retail location, there should be a sticker that says class one, two, or three. Or if you're looking at the bikes online, um, look in the manufacturer's description and it should say what type it is. Um, also be aware that electric bicycles can be heavier and require more distance to stop than traditional bicycles. Um, take them for a test ride, see what it feels like, do a little uh, update on your e-bike rider education. Um, there's some great resources that People for Bikes is coming out with, and the League of American Bicyclists also has some great advice. Um, this is an issue that may not be around for long. We know older models of electric bicycles are heavier, um, but it's going to be really hard to tell the difference between an electric bicycle and a traditional bicycle here pretty soon. Manufacturers are constantly updating the design of these bikes, and I myself, as the e-bike director, have sometimes been fooled. Um, the key to safe biking is being comfortable and confident, whether you're riding an e-bike or a traditional bike. So as long as you can get on the bike, ride it, and feel good, it's probably the right bike for you. Again, this is why it's a great idea to go out and test. Next slide. Okay, now to North Carolina. In North Carolina, e-bikes follow the same rules of the road as human-powered bicycles. You are one of those 48 states. Local agencies set speed and access limits on your bike paths and greenways. So if you don't know if you can ride your e-bike, please make sure to reach out to the local agencies. And according to the North Carolina Division of Parks and Recreation, class one, two, and three e-bikes are allowed wherever electric bicycles are allowed or traditional bicycles are allowed. This is a big deal. This is not that common in other state parks across the country. 
um, take advantage. It's really fun. Uh, get out on, on your bike and, and ride those trails. It's good stuff. Okay, next. All right, Mason talked about this a little bit. One of the main reasons I took this job as the electric bicycle director is to get people out of cars and onto bikes. This is an excellent way to reduce our carbon footprint, to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce air pollution, urban congestion. There's just so many great things that happen when more people ride bicycles and electric bicycles. Um, reducing your carbon footprint is just one. The health impacts, the financial impacts, all of that um, is a great reason to try and to buy an electric bicycle. Next slide. And lots of Americans are doing it. So we don't have perfect data on e-bike sales, but industry analysts estimate more than 12 million electric bicycles will be sold in the U.S. between 2020 and 2030. This is a big boom. This is a lot of interest in electric bicycles and bicycling overall. And one of my jobs and the industry's jobs is to keep this boom going. Next slide. So 2018 is kind of not the beginning of our data on e-bike sales. We know they were around for quite a while, but as you can see from this graph, graph, it's not exponential necessarily, but it's close. There's a lot of interest in electric bicycles. And we know why. It's because they're fun. They reduce a lot of barriers to riding and they're getting more people out uh, who otherwise wouldn't ride or hadn't ridden for quite a while. Next slide. So those were previous sales. That's the data that we have. These are projected sales. We think that there will be quite a lot more electric bicycles out there. Um, the boom of the pandemic has slowed a little bit, but not for electric bicycles. There's a lot of interest in these e-bikes and there's a lot more models that are being uh, created and designed uh, for different needs of everyday Americans. I know multiple people that have multiple e-bikes in their garages. Um, I also know many folks who got rid of their car, one of their cars for an electric bicycle. So we hope that this is a trend that's gonna continue. All right, so with all of these folks riding, it's really important that we focus on safety. Some of the data that we've seen is that a lot of the new riders of electric bicycles during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic uh, are people that are new to riding overall, whether these are teenagers that are using e-bikes to get them from uh, point A to point B before they drive a car or um, parents who realize, oh, this is a great way for me to get out um, with my kids on the back of my cargo bike or uh, Older Americans who, you know, may not have thought about bicycling before because it was something that felt like too uh, physically demanding and are now realizing like, oh, I can go ride. There's a lot of education that needs to happen for everyone who's riding, whether you've ridden a bicycle before or not. Safety is a really important piece of keeping people riding. So People for Bikes is working with the League of American Bicyclists to create an e-bike rider safety curriculum. We're going to do kind of a 101 version of this that will be coming out in August, and I can send Mason and the team all the information when this comes out. But it's not just about how to safely ride. It's also about things like what are the different components of your electric bicycle? How do you safely charge your battery? All of those pieces. Next slide. So this is one version of an electric bicycle, and there's a lot to know about them. I'm not going to go over each of the different components or you know how to test your brakes, but the safety curriculum that we're creating is going to give you tips and pointers on not just what are the components, how do you brake, how do you get on, how do you stop, all of the different components of the bike, but also what is responsible e-bike battery charging? What should your helmet fit like? What are the things that you should make sure are ready to go before you ride? Tire pressure, things like that. We say it's as easy as riding a bike. Riding a bike is pretty easy, but making sure that your bike is ready to ride takes a little bit of work. Next one. This is a big topic for people for bikes in the industry overall. 
battery safety. You might have heard of uh, different battery fires happening in New York City. To our knowledge, none of our endemic bicycle industry member brands have been uh, implicated in any of the fires in New York, but it is still our job as the industry to help educate folks on how to responsibly manage and charge your lithium ion batteries. I will say if it's a high quality um, certified battery, your chances of a fire are extremely, extremely low. And they're even lower if you know these quick tips on how to safely handle and charge your e-bike battery. Um, I think you're going to get the slides after this, so I'm not necessarily going to read all of this. But um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, the biggest point of this is do not modify or attempt to repair your e-bike battery. That is a big no-no. These have a lot of energy within the batteries. That's how they can help us move faster and farther. Uh, and it's much better idea to take these bikes uh, into your local retailer for service and help. Next slide. And then finally, a big piece of our rider education curriculum is rules of the road. If you ride already, you probably already know things like how to signal when you're turning, when you're slowing down. Um, there's a lot of folks that don't know these rules and etiquette, both for road and for trail. So this is going to be another big piece that People for Bikes leans into, both in this initial phase, this 101, how to ride, but also in future phases when we work with local schools and retailers and others uh, to help with this education piece. Okay, so we moved through safety. How do we make e-bikes more affordable? E-bike incentives are the key. As I mentioned earlier, we have state, federal, and local e-bike incentives that are currently operating in the US. Um, there were 14 states this year that proposed e-bike incentives. And if passed, these programs will allocate over $30 million to the purchase of new e-bikes across the country. If you would like to talk about uh, e-bike incentive in North Carolina or in Raleigh, we are very happy to help you with that. Next slide, please. We actually just created the electric bicycle incentive toolkit. So we've, we have been studying these incentives for the last five years, and we've looked at you know, what works, what doesn't work as well. We've looked at different motivations for creating these e-bike incentives. Some of them are around greenhouse gas emission reduction. Some of them are around health. Some of them are around decongesting urban spaces. Um, these are some of the most tangible climate policy tools that we've been able to harness so far. Um, but there's a lot of other reasons to encourage uh, e-bike incentives. And uh, this is a big thing that People for Bikes is um, working with local municipalities as well as um, states and federal government to help promote. Next, please. Okay, here comes the adorable monster. I talked about battery safety before. E-bike batteries are a big deal. They are one of the main reasons why we've seen this huge boom in sales uh, is this electrical assist while we're riding. What we know about these e-bike batteries is that they generally last about five years. And so you saw from the data, it's been more than five years since e-bikes have been on the scene. And the industry realized that we needed to create a sustainable solution to this e-bike battery recycling issue. You cannot throw away these batteries. They are hazardous materials and you don't really wanna throw them away because we can continue to use a lot of the components of these batteries um, in future uh, you know, reuse and recycle uh, these future batteries. So we created this e-bike battery recycling program that I get to oversee. The program is supported by over 50 brands, and it's the first of its kind in the transportation industry. We did this before cars, people. Bikes did it. Industry-wide program that uh, has over 1,800 locations for drop-off retail locations across the U.S. So this is a sustainability play, and it's also a safety play. Next one. In the first year, we collected and recycled over 36,000 pounds of e-bike batteries. This is this is great news. There's a lot more out there, but we've got this solution in hand. Um, on top of having the sustainability play, we also have the safety piece of 
not just creating uh, education that faces the riders, but also education for retailers. So each retail location of the 1800 plus across the country has uh, battery safety training, as well as kits that help make sure that the batteries are safe and contained while they're being held at the retail location before they're shipped off to the recycling facility. This is all very nerdy, very uh, kind of environmentally focused work. What we realized when we went to the public with this campaign is we needed someone to help us tell the story. Next slide. That person is Mr. Watts. Isn't he so cute? Uh, Watts is hungry for batteries. We last week launched the Hungry for Batteries campaign, which is the story and the narrative for the public to get excited about recycling batteries. It took us a long time to figure out how we were going to get people excited about recycling batteries. Turns out all we needed was an adorable puppet. This is Mr. Watts. He's hungry for batteries. Next slide, please. And he will be rolling out across the country uh, for all of these different uh, retail locations and for many more that will be coming on board so that people know where they can responsibly recycle their, their batteries and they can feel good about it because we are feeding Mr. Watts. This is my favorite. Okay, next. All right, I've shared a lot and I hope I didn't go too far over time. There's a lot more to learn about electric bicycles. Uh, please feel free to visit our website, uh, www.peopleforbikes.org. Uh, reach out to me. I will share my uh, email contact information. I think we're going to have a Q&A after this. If you really want to go big on all things electric bicycles, we are hosting a full three-day event in Bentonville in October, October 16th to the 18th on electric bicycles and all the great things that are happening in the space. So if you'd like to join us in beautiful Bentonville, Arkansas, you are cordially invited. I think that might be the end. Thank you so much for the time, for the interest, and uh, is it time for questions? So we have a few more uh, presentations we're going to go through, and then we will move to questions uh, uh, at the end. But yes, uh, Ash, thank you. That was terrific. I actually learned a ton in that, um, even though I've been in the space for a little bit and learning all about bicycling. Um, so thank you so much for presenting all of this information. Uh, as a reminder, again, please keep adding questions in the Q&A. We're going to get to those at the end. Um, before we get to our next speaker, we're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to show you a video that we've produced that kind of has some general safety tips and bike lean lingo. And now we will cross our fingers to hope that the video plays. Smarter, not harder. Presented by Commute Smart Raleigh. Today we will learn bike lane lingo. The city of Raleigh is always working on improving its bike infrastructure to make cycling a comfortable, practical, and enjoyable alternative to driving. Let's take a look at the different types of bike. Hmm. Commute smarter, not harder. Normal travel lane and. Let's take a look at the different types of bike facilities there are and how to navigate them. Conventional bike lanes dedicate space in the street exclusively for cyclists. They include a solid white stripe between the general travel lane and the bike lane. They are marked by a bicyclist symbol with arrows indicating the direction of travel. Shared lane markings, also known as sharrows, are markings in the street that look like a bicycle and two arrows. Sharrows help cyclists position themselves to be visible in the street. They also communicate that the lane is intended for both cyclists and motorists. Buffered bike lanes have a painted buffer between the bike lane and the general travel lane. In some cases, the painted buffer might appear between the bike lane and on-street parking to help bicyclists avoid drivers opening car doors. Separated bike lanes, unlike buffered ones, are bike lanes that are separated from general travel lanes with some kind of vertical element. They are also called protected bike lanes. There are various separation types, including flexible posts, curb stops, concrete curbs, or even planters. Separated bike lanes may be designed to also accommodate one-way or two-way travel. These facilities are called cycle tracks. The green two-stage turn boxes, or bike boxes for short, provide a space for bicyclists to make left turns at intersections, especially useful when car volume is high. 
To use the bike box, pass traffic on the right and position yourself to cross the street when the light turns green to not have to unsafely maneuver your way over to the left lane from a bike lane. These green dashed portions of bike lanes function in the same way as conventional bike lanes, but the green paint is intended to increase driver awareness of bicyclists. For example, a cyclist might want to go straight through the intersection, but a driver would like to take a right turn. These dash green bike lanes are for everybody to approach with caution and avoid conflict or even a bad collision. Side paths are paved trails that are located along the street. They are wider than sidewalks so that bicyclists and pedestrians can travel side by side and are oftentimes integrated with the city's greenway system. Also, cars are not allowed to park in a bike lane for any amount of time. And drivers, please always look out for cyclists before exiting your vehicle. Make it a habit to use your right hand to open your car door. This will make it easier to look behind you and check for any cyclists before opening. This technique is also known as a Dutch reach. And remember, North Carolina law establishes the same access for cyclists and motorists to all public streets. So now that you're up to date with the lingo, enjoy riding through Raleigh. If you have questions on how to safely enjoy a bike commute or any other way to commute, please contact us at commute at RaleighNC.gov. Awesome. Hopefully you all enjoyed that video. Uh, if you want to watch that again or check out other videos in our series, uh, just go to YouTube, type in Commute Smarter, Not Harder, and it'll pull up our whole uh, library of videos for you to watch. Um, moving on to our next presenter, we have Jacob Torbert. Uh, originally from Roanoke, Virginia, Jacob has called North Carolina home for the past seven years. After serving with the 82nd Airborne Division, he left the Army in 2018 to pursue his passion of working with bikes. Today, he is living his 13-year-old self's dream as the co-owner of East Coast Electric Speed Shop, North Carolina's premier e-bike service center with two locations, one in Carboro and one here in downtown Raleigh. And so, now without further ado, I pass it over to Jacob. Hello, hello. Alrighty then, so I'm going to be diving into a little bit of the dirty details, uh, specifically along of what, what the process looks like of buying a new e-bike and also maintaining that new e-bike. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say, um, Dr. Ash, thank you for all the work you do with People for Bikes. Um, it can be hard to imagine making America as uh, bikeable as the Netherlands, but that becomes a lot more believable once you learn some more of the history there. You know, it wasn't always uh, a bikeable uh, country after World War II. It took a lot of work from activists to kind of turn it into a bikeable country. Um, also, Mason, I, I believe the e-bike can save the world as well. Uh, it's really just so much fun getting to work in this industry and getting to work with a lot of folks um, who probably wouldn't have normally gone into a bike shop to begin with, but now that they have the e-bike as an option, it really opens up those doors for a lot of new people. Um, so starting your search for an e-bike can be really overwhelming. Uh, there's a ton of different options on the internet, uh, and it can be hard to make sense of what's worth your money and what's not worth it. So I'm going to start off by just going over the e-bike classes a real, real quick again. Um, so it, it can be really confusing trying to figure out the e-bike classes. Um, in North Carolina, all e-bike, all bicycles are treated as vehicles, meaning that we have to follow the same rules of the road. So that means stopping at stoplights and stop signs using turd signals if the bike is equipped with them, and also um, using hand signals if the bike does not have turn signals on them. Most bikes don't have turn signals, but a lot of the newer models are starting to come out with them. So class one is gonna be pedal assist only, 20 mile an hour top speed. Class two is gonna be a 20 mile power top speed, but you also have a throttle. And class three is gonna be 28 miles an hour, uh, no throttle. So. The next kind of big thing that you'd be looking for is mid-drive versus hub drive. Uh, hub drive usually is going to have a throttle. At least most of the models that we sell are going to have throttles. The motor is actually going to be located inside of the, the usually the rear wheel. Um, so it's actually laced into the wheel with the spokes. This is kind of nice because it allows the motor to work independently of the chain. So for commuters, this is a great option because if you have a throttle and you blow your chain for some reason, you're still able to make it home using the throttle. Um, the mid drive is going to be located where the crank arms would be or the pedals. 
So right in between where your feet would normally be, you'll have your motor there. And that's going to power through the chain, just like a, a motorcycle would. So that's going to allow you to actually use the motor and power it through your gears. A lot of mountain bikers really like these options because it allows them to have a wider gear range powered through the motor. Most of the time, mid drives are not going to have throttles. There are some, a few options out there that do though. So the first question I ask anybody when they're looking for an e-bike is, what type of riding are you looking to do? Um, there's lots of crossover in the e-bike world, meaning that um, you could get one bike and do lots of different things with it. So the first thing I'll talk about is commuting. So you've got the classic commuter. This is someone who is purely interested in the e-bike as a way to get around town and use their car less, or maybe to avoid having to get a car. This is where the Dutch style e-bike, um, the cargo bike, and uh, the more traditional commuter bikes really start to shine in an e-bike form. Uh, next, we're going to have the fitness commuter. A lot of people like to call these flat bar road bikes. So these are going to usually be a little bit lighter, have thinner tires on them, more similar to what you might see on a traditional road bike. Um, these are going to make uh, great bikes for people who are maybe looking to ride into the office and not break a sweat and then also get exercise when they're riding home from the office. Uh, and I also did have some uh, some style, some bikes if you wanted to look at to kind of get some ideas of what these styles. So the classic commuter, Dutch style, I, the option, the examples I have are going to be the Bellatrix Discover, um, the Event in Level, and the Event in Abound. So the Event in Abound is going to be more of a cargo bike. Um, and fitness commuters, some examples I have are going to be the Bellatrix Thunder, the Event in Solterra, or the Specialized Vado. Um, and then we've got the off-road commuter. So traditional mountain bikes didn't really make great commute commuters um, because you had the added weight of suspension components, bigger tires, more rolling resistance. Now with the e-bike, it really allows you to, um, to use that bike for a lot of different things. So you've got the motor, which is going to really make that rolling resistance and extra weight a lot less noticeable. Um, so a lot of people you'll see riding around on fat tire e-bikes as a commuter. Um, the nice thing about this is they can still ride on the road, get where they need to go commuting wise, and then also hit some light trails if they wanted to. So some examples of that would be the Magnum T7 for a mountain bike, the Aventon Adventure Fat Tire, or maybe the Trek Powerfly. What if you're not looking for a commuter though? So some people come in here and they're specifically looking for a mountain bike. Uh, the most common e-mountain bike that we see on the market right now is going to be the fat tire uh, bike. So we see a lot of those options. There's a lot of those between the uh, $1,500 and $2,000 price point that are gonna get you a pretty nice bike. Uh, now, this isn't gonna be something you wanna use for aggressive trail riding, but if you just wanna do a little bit of light riding and maybe some adventuring on the weekend, this is a nice option. The next one we're gonna have is gonna be the hardtail e-mountain bike. So this is gonna be more traditionally what we think of when we think of a mountain bike. Most of these are gonna be mid drives, although there are some hub drive options. If you're going to be riding aggressive mountain biking, I would highly recommend going with a mid-drive motor. This is going to make the bike more balanced because the weight is going to be more towards the center. Um, the hub drive is nice for people who just want to do some light mountain biking. But if you're going to be hitting big jumps and riding really aggressive stuff, you want that kind of you want that better balanced bike so that you're not tail heavy like you would be with a rear hub motor. Um, some examples I had for that were going to be um, the again the Magnum T7 the Reed E-Trail, which is going to be a mid-drive bike. They have a mid-drive and a hub drive option. Um, and then the Trek Powerfly again. So for full suspension e-mountain bikes, which is going to be our next step up from that, this is going to be for our more serious mountain bikers. So this is going to be what you're looking for if you want to go and ride up in the mountains on the weekend. Now, you can do some mountain riding on a hardtail, but if you want to hit big jumps, you're going to want that extra suspension, especially with the added weight of the mountain bike. So some examples for that are going to be the Specialized Levo and the Bull's Copperhead that I have here. Uh, now, the last e-mountain bike style, I'm going to call the motorbike style. So this is more like a moped, looks more like a traditional uh, motorbike or kind of like a dirt bike a little bit. Um, these are going to still have pedals on them. Um, some examples for that are going to be the Super 73 or Juice Bikes. Make some really cool options from that. Now, these are not going to be bikes that you're going to want to get if, you, if, you, if you're looking to do pedaling. Now, these are more throttle-specific bikes. The reason these aren't as comfortable to pedal is you can't adjust the seat height. So you cannot get a full leg extension, making it not as comfortable of a pedaling bike. Um, and then we're going to dive into cargo bikes a little bit. So this is going to be um, the kind of bike you're looking for more specifically as a commuter. 
Um, so I've got light duty, personal use. Um, some options looking for there are going to be turn, has some really great options, the Magnum Pathfinder, the Rad Runner, or the Event and Cinch, which is a folding bike that can also be used for some light duty uh, cargo work. Um, you're usually only going to be able to carry one kit on these and maybe some light groceries. If you're looking to carry multiple kids, I would look at a full size cargo bike, something like the Event and Abound, the Magnum Payload or the Yuba Supercargo or the Spicy spicy Curry. These are going to have a bigger weight limit that they can carry on them. So you can carry two kids on them um, or some more groceries if that's what you're looking for. All right, so that's just a brief overview on what we're looking for on an e-bike. So if you come into the shop, we're going to walk through those steps with you. And then this, after we talk through it, we would go ahead and put you out on a test ride. So that's the, really the main thing I recommend when you're looking for an e-bike is go talk to somebody who who uh, go talk to a shop who is qualified to, to talk over e-bikes with you and then go test ride them because it can be really hard to, to know what you like until you get out and ride it just because there are so many options. Um, so we're going to dive into e-bike maintenance a little bit. So battery health and safety. We talked about that a little bit with Dr. Ash. Um, there's a lot of talk about e-bike fires right now. I always like to say I have never met someone or even met someone who knows someone who's had an e-bike fire um, that I didn't really even understand how this was happening until I went to New York City for uh, the first time about a month and a half ago for CABDA, which is a big bike event. Um, and uh, I saw every corner packed full of very sketchy e-bikes that were being used for um, deliveries. So there are a lot of people up there modifying their e-bike batteries. Um, and so the main thing to keep your battery healthy is just, to, just don't modify it at home. If you have battery issues, bring it into a shop that's qualified to, to test it. Um, and then they can either fix it in-house or send it off if necessary, or just get a new battery. It's not worth the safety risk of trying to modify your own battery. Um, buy from a reput reputable dealer. All the bikes that we sell are going to be UL certified or UL qualified. Um, and uh, don't go for cheap bikes. So most bikes below $1,000, they have to cut costs somewhere. And a lot of times that's going to be on the things that you can't see inside of. So uh, motor components, battery components, bearing components. So cheap bikes are usually going to have cheap components. Um, and charging safety, all of the chargers on the bikes that we use are tested for 24-hour overcharge protection. However, we do not recommend you leave them on the charger any longer than it takes to charge them up fully. And don't charge them unattended, as was said before. So that's the best way that you can make sure that you're charging your bike safely. It's just to always make sure you're around when it's charging and that you're awake and alert. If it were to overheat, you would be able to notice it long before it actually turned into a fire. Um, and last but not least, only use the original manufacturer charger, as Dr. F said as well. So I'm going to dive into some mechanical maintenance a little bit. We, the fir first best place to start with a new bike is getting it professionally assembled. We recommend professionally, professional assembly for all new bikes, um, even if it says that it's ready to go out of the bikes, if, you, if it's ready to go out of the box. You buy a, maybe buy a direct consumer bike online and they say, you just pull it out and ride it. I can promise you it almost is never quite that simple. Things always get knocked loose during shipping. Uh, things, components can get knocked out of alignment. Um, and when you ride a bike that's not in proper alignment and not properly tuned up, it's going to wear those components out quicker. So you're going to get less life out of components on the bike. So a little bit of money up front for professional assembly will get you a longer, safer ride. Now, say you just picked up a new bike um, that's already been professionally assembled. When should you bring it in for your next service interval? So the first service interval we do with all new bikes is going to be our basic maintenance. Every bike that we sell comes with one or comes with lifetime free basic maintenance. And so that's just a quick 15 to 20 minute tune up. You bring it by, we adjust your cables to make sure everything's wearing in properly. It also gives us a chance to look over the whole bike and just make sure everything is wearing in as we want it. And we can catch any problems that might be coming up. After that, we recommend you bring the bike by anytime you hear any weird noises. If something just doesn't feel right, you know, bring it by. We can usually catch things before it gets super expensive to fix. Um, the basic maintenance also just give us a chance to just to check over everything. So after that is going to be a full tune up. So full tune ups, we usually do six months to a year out from riding. Sometimes you can make it a little longer than that, but we always recommend coming in at about six month intervals at the minimum, just to make sure we're catching any problems before they turn into serious problems. A tune up is going to be involved going through the full bike. So we're going to look at the wheels and make sure that the spokes are tensioned properly. 
We're going to check the brakes and make sure that they're aligned and that the brake pads are not worn out. So if the brake pads are looking good, we'll just adjust everything as needs be. We're gonna also go through all the bearings on the bike, make sure that the bearings are adjusted properly and that we're wearing those in as they should. Um, and uh, we're also gonna look through all our shifting and uh, give the bike a good wipe down. So it's just a good opportunity for us to dig through everything and make sure we're not wearing out components faster than we should be and replacing anything as we need to. And outside of that, there are just some small things you might have to do. The brake pads, because of how you ride, maybe weren't worn in a lot when you brought in for the tune-up. So we might hold off now. And in about three to six months, we'll bring we'll have you stop back by for a brake pad change. Or maybe your tires weren't quite ready to be changed out during the tune-up. So we can just circle back once you wear this down a little more and you're ready for a new tire. Um, I like to call those disposables. So brake pads, tires, tubes, things like that. Um, a big question we get all the time, are the bikes waterproof? So the bikes are water resistant, meaning uh, we've driven through hurricane weather with these bikes on the back of our trucks with no problems. We get to where we're going and we hop out and we go ride. Now I have seen people accidentally submerge the bikes in the ocean, for instance. You're usually not gonna be able to ride out from that. All the components on the bike are water resistant except for the controller. And the controller is what controls all the power that's going from the battery into the motor and through the screen and everything. Um, once that gets submerged in water, we're usually gonna have to replace that component and usually some other components with that because it shorts things out. So is the bike waterproof? Up to an extent, don't submerge it. Don't go riding through crazy deep creeks. Now you can wait through some, some small creeks and things like that if you're mountain biking, uh, but don't submerge any components. Now, the last thing I will go over is just a quick pre-ride safety check. So what do I do before I hop out on a bike? So the first thing I do is I walk to the front of the bike, I pinch the wheel between my front legs and I just give the handlebar a quick little turn. I'm checking to make sure that the headset bearings are adjusted tight and that when I turn the wheel, the wheel is gonna go where I want it to go. The other thing I'm gonna do is walk around the bike and just check all the tires or the wheels. I'm gonna give them a little nudge and make sure that they feel like they're, they're fully seated in the dropout. If I think they might be loose at all, I'm gonna double check those dropouts um, where the axle is and just make sure that wheel's fully tight in there. I'm gonna check my tire pressure. You know, just like in your car, if your tire pressure is low, it's gonna affect your fuel mileage. If your tire pressure is low on your bike, it can affect the range that you get out of the bike because it adds to the rolling resistance. So check your tires. And then I always like to give my brakes a good squeeze and just nudge the bike back and forth and make sure I have good brakes in there. And after I go through that, I'm gonna hop out on the road and ride. So that's a quick, easy safety check. Now, any bike that goes out the door for us is gonna get a uh, pre-ride check. When that, and when we do that, we're gonna actually go through the full bike with a torque wrench and torque everything down to manufacturer specifications and check over the whole bike. But most people don't have a torque wrench at home. So that's a quick, easy safety check that you can do. Um, last but not least, I will just say, make sure you lube your chain. Uh, we can always, bike mechanics can always hear uh, dry chains as we're riding down the road, because it just sounds like you're getting followed by a flock of birds. They're just chirping at you. So the easiest way to do is I'll pinch the chain if it feels dry um, and I don't have any lube that comes back on my fingers. I will just grab my bottle of lube, uh, spin the pedals backwards, give it a nice good coating, and then I'll grab an old rag and just wipe that excess grease off. We're not trying to lube the outside of the chain. We just want to lube the inside of the pivots and extra grease and oil on the outside is just going to pick up dirt and grime that we don't want. Um, and so doing that process will both clean and lubricate your chain. So that is my spiel on buying a new bike, a new e-bike, and also maintaining and servicing your e-bike. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and again, a great, a great presentation. We'll move into our Q&A really quickly and we'll kind of run through a few. Um, so the first question, and this is for you, Jacob, specifically, um, what is the benefit or point to having gears on an e-bike? So on a hub drive motor, you, the gears, the chain isn't actually powering into the gears, but it does allow you to pedal um, a little bit easier when you're climbing up hills. Now on a mid-drive motor where the power is actually being pushed through the chain, every step in gear range is actually going to affect uh, how much you can pedal. It's kind of hard to explain, um, but there's a ratcheting system inside of a hub motor, which makes the gears and the hub itself work independently of it. So gears are very important on a mid-drive bike, still important on a hub drive bike, um, but less, less so. Awesome. Um... And Ash, this next one will be for you. So they ask, I've heard a recent, I heard a lot recently 
about e-bike rebate programs, but how effective are they in getting more people on e-bikes? Great question. Super effective, uh, especially if you have good bicycling infrastructure already. So what we're seeing is a lot of um, a lot of incentive and rebate programs are modeling themselves after the Denver program. And the Denver program has sold out twice and has been renewed three times now. Uh, and that is tens of thousands of folks that are buying electric bicycles through this rebate program. We already have decent, decent cycling infrastructure, um, but those two things combined make these programs pretty successful. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, I love seeing that. I know I've been looking very intently into the Denver program, if that's something that uh, is a possibility to be explored here. Um, Jacob, the next one for you. Um, they ask, should I bring the bike into charge after each use, or is it better to run the battery down as much as possible before recharging it? Okay, so great question. And I, I meant to go over this a little bit, actually. I'm sorry for the phone ringing in the background, if you can hear that. Um, so battery, excuse me. So battery, charging your battery after each ride. So my recommendation is the best for the best health of the battery, you want to keep it between about 20 and 80% charge. Um, if you talk to an electrical engineer, they're going to tell you to keep it between 40 and 60%. That's impossible for anyone to do who's actually riding it. Um, so my recommendation is try to keep, do not let it go below 20%. Um, and uh, try to, if you want to keep it fully charged, that's okay. We're not going to actually change any of the chemistry of the battery unless we're really overcharging it at 100%. So if you get back from your ride and it's around 40 to 50%, you're welcome to take it out again for the next ride tomorrow, or you can charge it up that day. But for best battery health, you might want to knock it down to about 20% and then recharge it. However, I'd plug my personal bike in uh, if it's at 40, 50% all the time, just because I want to get the max charge out of my next ride and make sure I have the most uh, most comfort knowing how many miles I have out of it. So I hope that hope that answered it well. Awesome. And then time for one more question. Um, and Ash, this will be for you. Uh, so with e-bikes increasing in popularity, has there also been an increase in thefts? Um, and how can the general public minimize theft risk? Mm. Very good question. We haven't seen the data on an increase in thefts, uh, but I don't know if that just is because we don't have the data. Uh, I would assume that there's there, bike theft is a thing. Uh, it happens a lot and it can happen with more expensive models, the same as it happens with traditional models. Uh, we definitely recommend having a good lock, a good U lock, um, maybe multiple. I know that there are e-bikes that have built-in locking systems uh, that you can use, especially the commuters and the cargo bikes. Um, so that's something that the manufacturers are starting to integrate into bikes. Um, but you know, there are safe uh, parking practices that can be used um, pretty strategically, which I'm sure you have some advice on, uh, Mason. But definitely something to be aware of. Uh, car theft is a thing. Bike theft is a thing. It's a thing that we're all working to reduce. But I mean, if you really want to reduce uh, car trips, make sure that when you come back, <laughs> the bike's still going to be there. Um, yeah, good question. Awesome. Um, well, that's all the time for questions today. I know we've got a lot more. And so I will kind of connect uh, after the webinar, follow up, get these questions answered. The word has any, all the information they'll need. Um, but other than that, please feel free to reach out to me at commute at raleighnc.gov. You can also reach me at raleighnc.gov slash commute smart. Find all my contact information there and all the information about bike month, um, e-bike usage, e-bike safety and all relevant links. So once again, thank you so much to both of our presenters for being here today and for everyone for attending. Um, happy bike month. We hope to see you rolling more out there. And on Friday, May 19th, we're going to be having a bike to work day. So please visit our website for all the pit stop locations for that as well. So thank you and have a wonderful day, everyone.